Scoopy Radio. Download it everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn App, Stitch App, or simply by visiting ScoopyRadio.com. I am Brandon Scoopy Robinson here. And to my left is a legend, Sonny Vaccaro. What's going on, sir? Everything. I'm on your show, hoping to you know, answer some questions for your audience, and uh, I'm glad that I'm able to do it. I'm looking forward to this. Really am. Yes, sir. You and I go back about over 10 years. Um, when I was in grad school at Hofstra, Sonny was uh, giving me insight uh, when I was discussing the international game as it relates to pros. And, and back then, it was really a big topic with Jeremy Tyler foregoing his senior year um, to play overseas in Israel. And then Brandon Jennings uh, going to Italy instead of playing uh, in college and, um, you know, and then going to the NBA after that. So it's been a while that we've spoken in person or digitally, but nonetheless, glad to have you, brother. It's, it's wonderful to be here and recollect and going back to the two young kids and uh, Brandon did pretty well for himself and he got injured. Jeremy did well for a minute or two, played at Golden State, uh, got drafted, made five dollars, but uh, I don't think his heart, you know, was in it. I just don't, uh, you know, that happens and it's, you know, but he had the opportunity and he did what he wanted to do, he and his family. And uh, I'm proud of all kids who go forward with their lives and have faith in themselves. And look where we've come from yeah. Brad Jennings and until we're, you know, today where if we would have had NILs and the, the, at the time of Brandon and Jeremy and other kids, we wouldn't have to pay second fiddle to the European kids because that was my big gripe at that time. I, I know Gil and Ellie and a bunch of the, you know, guys from Europe were able to come to America when they were 17 and 18 and no one said anything and our kids weren't allowed. So I, I'm proud of all the kids who tried it, uh, who got through it, and I'm proud of where we are today and Today is a lot different than I thought about way back then. Yeah, you um, you definitely had your hand on the pulse of basketball for a long time. Um, specifically, many people go back to um, your time at Nike. Um, and I remember that since our discussion about Jeremy and uh, Brandon, we talked uh, about Michael Jordan specifically um, because of a conversation that you and I had about George Raveling and about Michael. The whole process of uh, Michael signing to, to Nike came about. I want to kind of advance that conversation because the last dance happened in between you and I uh, talking last. Um, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on the last dance and how Michael and his whole branding portion of it was depicted did you did you was most of the stuff that they said in the last dance pretty accurate i think all the stuff was accurate except you know i i i wasn't present in the last dance and i i uh, it hurt my feelings and it was wrong to begin with but the last dance was one of the greatest things ever done there's no question because it was michael it was during the the time of uh history being made and and and, and, and stories being told and lies moving forward and being remembered, Brandon. And I think that's what hurt me most was uh, you know, that I was not part of the dance. I mean, Michael and his teammates did all that. I never never said I was or whatever. It just that uh, at some point in time during that show, they could have put something in there that Michael and I were as close as we can get during the time we spent together. And it was years that I'll never forget and years that uh, that I'll cherish as being part of my life and uh, and to add it to the success of my life. So for that, I'm ever grateful. But uh, time moved on and uh, it, it was what it was and it, it can't be replicated. It's like watching the, today, we're like a few years later, obviously, the, the Redeem King. I mean, I watched that with um, a love and affection and also it told a wonderful story also, but it, it stayed on script because basically, you know, and unfortunately, one of the main people aren't with us today, Kobe, and he was definitely a part of, you know, the success of that team as a lot of other things in his life. But I think history, you know, can only be remembered by books. And now as we advanced into the world, you know, society and shows like you do and other people do, but I think documentaries are, going to be the savior of mankind in a way instead of 
writing things on the walls like they did a million years ago. And you know somebody lives because they wrote something. So there was something, whatever, you know, uh, so, you know, whatever words were being used were translated later on. Everything in history that we can attest to as being truth was written on the scrolls of pieces of paper and on the walls of cement and rock. And that's what, uh, you know, I watch, uh, I love documentaries. Uh, I love documentaries an awful lot because, and I love what Ken Burns does. I mean, Ken Burns is the, is the author of documentaries. I mean, there have been other great ones and there will be other great ones after this. But a documentary is something that is what it says. It's a documentary, it's the document. This isn't a political thing where certain documents lose their life and are destroyed. This is for the benefit of mankind. And no matter how trite or little they may seem to others because somebody may not like sports, somebody may not like the forest, somebody may not like the way, you know, the moon hits the sun and all that sort of stuff, right? But it's important to mankind. It's a crisis because history could be rewritten without truth to it. Mm -hmm. And that would be awful. And I've lived long enough, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time in this section, but my point to you, I've lived long enough to be history repeated, but also how it destroys people. And if it's a lie, if it's a lie, Brandon, then, and if you're not able to fight back, whether you're an individual, whether you're a religion, whether you're a political party, if you can't fight back for the truth, that lie will take place and it will survive history. And that would be sad. Well, you talk about history, Sonny. I, I appreciate your insight um, because there's one thing I want to get from you on the record that you've heard so many different iterations of it, and you'd be the first perfect person to ask. You started at Nike at a point you were at Adidas, and Kerry Kittles was drafted by the new, then the New Jersey Nets in the 96 draft. Kobe Bryant was also part of that draft. He was selected 13th overall by the Charlotte Hornets. His rights were traded to the Lakers for Vlade Divac. Many people have said that you were in the Nets' ear, the Lakers' ear, and the Hornets' ear about Kobe. You kind of knew what you guys had with him. What are your recollections of the Nets wanting Kobe and Kobe ultimately going to Charlotte and then traded to the Lakers? I was intimately involved with the whole thing. And from the first day that I met him, uh, and I met him because I knew his father. In 1972, Joe Jellybean played in my All-Star game, the Round Ball Classic in Pittsburgh. And he actually was the most valuable player. Uh, his mother, you know, Pam Cox, had a brother named Chubby Cox, who was really, really a good player in Philadelphia. And he played in the Round Ball in 73, I think. So I knew the Cox and the Bryant family. And lo and behold, 20 plus years later, I lose track of Joe. I know he was drafted in Philly. I know he had a pro career. I know he went to Italy. I knew about Joe because I'm a basketball fan, but I never saw him nor talked to him since the time he hugged me and thanked me for the round ball and inviting him to Pittsburgh. And now, lo and behold, I get a call one day, and it was from Joe Bryant. And he told me he had this kid I didn't know anything about. Did a, you know, talked about ABCD camp. Joe was living in Philadelphia at that time. I believe he was assistant coach at uh, LaSalle. And I also had my very best friend at that time, Gary Charles, who basically was totally involved with everything I did at that time and until present day. And he knew Joe because Joe knew Gary because of local things. And Joe and Joe calls me and, you know, goes to Gary and and we he gets invited to camp. Now, never saw uh, uh, Kobe play in high school, I never saw any Lower Marion games. And he had just come over from Italy. That was the first year back going into his junior year. And Gary had known about him. And so Joe and Pam bring their son, Kobe, to ABCD camp. I had never met him. And, and Gary brings him over to me. And there and behold is the three of them. Now, after that, after that day, I watched him progress. And for the record on your show here, I said this before, I knew something special just because the way my mind works. After the week was over at um, ABCD, 
Kobe had made the junior all-star team and the kids were breaking and, and, and Gary came over, but everybody came over and, and Pam and Joe, Joe Bryant came over and Kobe comes by himself. He comes and gives me a big hug and he said, thank you, Mr. Vaccaro for inviting me to camp. And I said, you know, he says, um, but I'm disappointed. And I'm hugging him and he's hugging me and I, I don't know what I did, but I look back, I said, what do you mean you made the all-star team? That's what the kids, you know, that's very important as you know. You know, you played against, you know, the other all-stars and, um, and he said, no, he says, I'm coming back next year and I'm going to be the best player in the whole camp. Now this was, not yet, he hasn't left. Now he was playing down here in Sunny Hill League in Philadelphia. He played games. We knew about him. I mean, they did. Nobody else in the world did. You know, I didn't know about him, but I, you know, until Joe called me and Gary brings him to me. And after that, I have, was not separated from Kobe Bryant. So to go to the story, was I intimately involved? I was intimately involved that I was, I was at everything he moved. When, when he got drafted by the pros, Pam and I helped him find a house that literally was on, on the same street we were on, but he was on top of the mountain. We were on the bottom of the mountain. You know, Joe and Pam and I went to dinner many times. Uh, I was with Kobe until he left Adidas and went to Nike. So yes, I, it was intimate, but that night, when they, I knew they were, the trade was being made. Arn Tellum, one of the best agents in America, um, he's no longer an angel, he runs Detroit now, but Arn and I are close friends. And, um, and he ended up representing Kobe. And uh, so we were in the green room and we know what's gonna happen. I had spent the, the morning of the draft and the, you know, the, before in, in New Jersey, I believe it was, and talking to John Calipari and you know the, the general manager and obviously I know all these people and it was a fact that he could have gone to Italy. There's no question about that. He could have gone to go back there as opposed to go to college or he could have gone to college. So we don't know what he's doing, but he couldn't have gone to college on draft night because he hired Arntella now. So we knew he wasn't going to college. So, so the draft comes and I knew, Pam and I knew, and Arn knew, and the family knew, uh, that the trade would have been made with Jerry West and the people in Charlotte. All he had to do was get to 13. Now, we knew the biggest ones that were, all, that were really, really interested was John Calipari. And we knew that they were interested. He talked to Arn a lot of times. I only talked to John uh, one time, you know, during the thing. Arn handled all that. But in the, in the green room, as they say, it comes to number eight. Now, and they say Terry Kittles. All the kids are in a green room with them. And Terry's right behind us. Pam and I jump up. And Arn jumps up. And we knew. And, and then we were embarrassed because of the, you know, the, the sisters, you know, everybody told me, why did you jump, Sonny? Why? We said, well, I knew Kerry Kittles. Everybody knew Kerry. He sat behind us. I said, we're happy for Kerry. He got drafted, and we won. I mean, we, it was a beautiful segue because I didn't know Carrie from the bat, like the camps, and all that sort of stuff. So it was a it was a natural thing. But to your audience, all he had to do was get past, you know, number eight, John. All he had to do was get past that because no one nine, ten, eleven, and twelve never worked Kobe on. So we knew they weren't taking. You kind of segued into my next question because Kittles went eight to the Nets. Then you had nine, you had the Mavs. You had 10, and the Mavs got Samaki Walker. 10, uh, the Pacers got Eric Dampier. 11, Todd Fuller to the Warriors via or Orlando and Washington. 12 was Vitaly Patapenko from, from the Cavs by way of Washington. Was it kind of like Arn told those other guys, don't pick Kobe? Or was it really those guys had no interest in Kobe because what was it? I think Arn probably, I was Arn's job and I didn't get involved in that. I answered people's questions the way I answered them. I wasn't his lawyer and Arn was, and he handled it beautifully. So, you know, for the record, when he signed a shoe contract with Adidas, Nike never made a bid. <laughs> so there was a lot of people did not believe in Kobe Bryant. I believed in him. You know, there's no question. You were with Kobe until he went to Nike. 
Um, and then when he went to Nike, of course, all of the controversy with the, the documented red case happened. And then he got through it. It was the first shoe that he had. It was the Hyper Dunk 2K4, but he had his logo on it. That was the launch. Um, but I've seen over time that Adidas has retroed the shoe, but it's the Crazy 8. That's the shoe that's that small. And then it was the one that was made after the Audi um, and a myriad of other things. Um, how much was Kobe as well as you involved in kind of the designing of those shoes? I was never involved in any design of any shoe. I am the most illiterate shoe person you're talking about. Shoe. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> but I, that's just who I am. Though. That wasn't my place with Kobe, definitely with Michael or any other kid. You know, um, only thing I was interested in was signing him and paying him what I said, you know, would, would be what he would get from the, you know, the shoe company I was with, Brandon. So I, I had no idea. I just know that, you know, Peter Moore designed the, the Nike shoes and he's pretty good. He grand, he did the first two Jordan shoes that went off the wall and, and lived happily ever after. He just passed away this, this beginning of this year. But my, my point to you, I had nothing to do with the shoe. I, I basically had nothing to do with any of the kids, including Michael, except be their friend and, and basically travel with them. And I did that with Kobe until he didn't end. I went everywhere with them and, you know, and we were together. And, and I'm still close to this minute with his mother and his father. I mean, they're, they're part of our best friend's life. I mean, that's what, what I've done. But my, just for your audience and I ask a specific question, mine is a transient life, Brandon. I met these kids when they were very young and go back to 65 when I had the first all-star game in the world. These people may not know. I had the first all-star game, the national all-star game, Pennsylvania against the United States in, in held in Pittsburgh, the Dapper Dan game was called. 13 years before there was a McDonald's game. So I, I knew that that's where my base was. I was 24 years old, but I never ever got involved with their lives. I, I became involved with them on their request or a natural thing. Like I can say today that of all the kids that I've gone through and there's been thousands, Tracy and I sort of like got together better than anybody. I mean, cause we're still, we still talk. We still go over ever since he came to the camp in 96 or 97, whenever it was. But mine has been transferred with all the athletes. I never got involved with their personal lives ever, ever, you know, in my life. I, I mean, I go back with all of them, including LeBron and everybody. I knew them when. When went into the eventual. They grew up and they had new friends, new business partners. I was never a business partner, but that's what happened. And that's why my life has been so beautiful. I can only relate and talk to you, Bob, and talk to all the people about what, you know, what I'm involved. If I was involved with that player or that team, I can do it. But when I, when my story finally comes out and hopefully God willingly it'll be sooner than later, uh, but it's at least on track. But my story here is, is to the public is, it's been the best journey in the world other than being with Pam. I mean, uh, I got to know them. And when I was with them, no matter how it ended up, I can't take away, and that's what I remember. I can only remember when I was with them at a very young age. LeBron James, uh, under your uh, wooing, but him ultimately signing on the line, signed a $90 million deal with Nike, which was at the time the biggest sneaker contract for someone of his caliber waiting to walk across the high school stage. In what world could he have made more than $90 million? LeBron and I made a deal way before that. No one who was James met he and his mother, and the company I worked for, Adidas, gave me their oath and their word of honor that I could offer the money. I never gave anybody any money, including Michael. I was in part of what the number was, but I never, you know, I don't pay it, I don't give it, but I spoke for the athlete when I represented the company. I always did that, and it's historically proved. And to go to LeBron, when I met LeBron before anybody else was involved, especially on that, I was, you know, I don't want to give you the whole story on that, but my point is, I was there. I was told I'd give him a hundred million. So when the day comes, that 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 number was and still is off the wall. I mean, uh, 
No one's ever gotten more than 100, I promise. And when I got to the day that we presented to the James family and, you know, everybody was involved with him, his attorneys and everything. Um, at that time, it was Aaron Goodwin and a man named Fred Shry, who I knew very well because he worked with me. But I, I had nothing to do with, I only had what I did. We opened up the presentation. I'd never seen it, like LeBron. And the number wasn't. It totaled, ours with incentives totaled 90 million. And that's what you're alluding to. But there was incentives that even got to 90 million. Well, there was no way they were going to get LeBron James for 70 plus incentives. First of all, when I first, the first thing I said to him, it's cash that day. Incentives will come after. I, I know what I said, and, and LeBron knows, and to this day he knows. But he and his mother and I were closely bonded, and, uh, and you know, uh, Maverick was involved with him, but Maverick was a young kid like he was at that time. Um, he isn't who he is today. And, um, and they all did well, but maybe history would have changed. But it couldn't have been changed for the better because he's turning out to be one of the greatest players ever played. And he's made more money and, you know, than anybody at this point in time off of shoe contracts and all that. So it was a good decision. My gripe was I gave somebody my word that I could do it, and I didn't do it. And I left Adidas right after that. So I want to get this straight. When you were at Adidas, they were going to give him a hundred LeBron James a hundred million and, and walked out on it? Yeah, they didn't put on that's exactly right. Okay. They they lied to me too, just so you know. The offer was a hundred million. Mm -hmm. I knew that would be something outlandish. I I'm pretty good at setting numbers and all my days at Nike, you know, there's always other people. They always cleaned it up. But the number I told all those coaches before there was even pro guy, before there was Michael, all those colleges, I said, I seen 85 colleges within a three or four mark period to wear Nike shoes. I mean, I, I gave the number for all 85 of those, including John Thompson and Jimmy Valvano and of course, Tark. I mean, so that's not, that was nothing due to me. And I gave it by the grace of God, I guess, of giving me ideas or something. I have no, I can't explain me to you, uh, that's for sure. But I can explain what's happened along my life. Mm -hmm. Victor Wembanyama, do you see him being able to nab a hundred million dollar deal out the gate? Uh, you know, I I'm on record as saying to nobody, I guess, to the people I talked to on the show, I did. But but this is a no brainer. This is a no brainer because because Michael, everything in the world starts with Michael, uh, it's two contracts, and LeBron, and then Zion. Zion did very, very well, but, you know, all that. But Victor's in a different position today. Why? We've already ordained him, and we've seen he's brilliant. The greatest minds in the world. Go back to even LeBron and Kobe and Tracy. Go back to all those kids, all the other great ones. You know, and there's been a hundred of them, right, since then. Victor's done it. And he's, he's someone that's so unique. It's almost, you know, sometimes I'm afraid of my words because I don't want to be explicit. But he's so physically different than anybody. And to me, he was mentally adept at handling his interviews better than any young kid I've ever seen. He just, you asked him a question and he gave you an answer. It was a, and a good answer. It may not be accepted by some people. So to answer your question, there's only one alternative. If I'm 30 years ago, Sonny Vaccaro, I go in and I say to one of these shoe companies, I'm your partner. It'll be my shoe. No one's gotten their shoe out of the drain. They have somebody said, this is the Ron shoe. This is the, the, the Kevin shoe. This is the, the whatever shoe. But it wasn't like, Jordan, where he had a piece of the product too. They named the shoe, but Jordan eventually got everything and it took him a minute or two to get everything, okay? Well, Victor is what I've seen in just clips and I, uh, I, I, I saw the clips and it was enough to convince me. I mean, a thousand, right now though, all the brains in, in pro sports, not only college, college has nothing to do with it, have watched him. 
I've never had a consensus. And I've contacted, I still have a lot of very good friends running teams and coaching teams. And Scott, I, in fact, I probably have somebody on every team that I'm very close to. And which is a gift that I've gotten over the years. No one said that there was all the same person, different names. He has a chance to be one of the greatest. Some people say Bill Russell. Others say, you know, you know Larry Bird. Or, I mean, you can say whoever you want to say. He does everything. Dan he can shoot, he can pass, he can talk, uh, he's charismatic, and he's physically different. He's, he's like bigger than Wilt, bigger than Bill. He's bigger than all these guys that were big. There was a time that I reflected on back in the 70s when I knew Moses really well and, and you know, and kids built like Moses and, and Shaquille and that they were men, that their bodies were huge. I mean, you know, they, they beat you up inside and they pushed his way. Mm -hmm. Hell, we don't have to. <laughs> and that's I'm throw three. But what impressed me in some of those clips I saw in some of the games I watched when he was in America, that sucker passes the ball like he's, you know, like I mean, like he's anybody. I mean, he just does it like the point guards. I mean, he just does it. And he never bitched, never moaned, you know, and he was forthright. So I'm saying to you, he he's going to get a piece of his shoe, his jersey, his sweat socks, his athletic supporter. I don't care what it is. I ask for it because he can win championships for you. Let me ask you a question. There's been a lot of controversy in the world with the things that have gone on with Kanye West and as far as Kyrie. Two-part question. Independently, now that Kanye is not with Adidas, could he independently create his own shoe and do well financially? And when Kyrie Irving's contract ends with Nike and he doesn't resume it, could he independently create a shoe and sell it independently? In the world we live in, anyone can do anything. There are people who will still abide by whatever was said by anybody, Brandon, and they could still, you know, make a dollar, I imagine. But the only thing you're leaving out, they could create a shoe, and they probably will, and maybe they should. I'm not gonna judge anybody here, other than I don't agree with both of them. And I'm very disappointed, very disappointed in the world we live in, in the time and period in history that we live in, where racism has never been more obvious in front and center than in America in the last four years. I mean, it's just a sad thing for me to say, and I'm not afraid or ashamed to say it. So it offends me when anybody would do it. And I'm not saying a black man, a green man, a, an Italian man, or I'm saying any person, this is your country. It's not perfect. They've never been perfect. Never been perfect. We've been divided since, since you know, whoever come over on the first boat. Mm -hmm. So let's understand that. But what I'm hearing from these two people, Sonny Vaccaro, and, and, and they can say what they want to say, but I would, I don't wish him any ill harm or any horrible death or whatever, but I would have nothing to do with them. I would just say it's nice, go on with your life. I just think there are, there, there has to be lines that you don't cross mentally to an individual, not socially, not whatever, but there have to be lines or, where, where is the meaning of what your life means if you don't have any, any feelings at all, if you don't have any justice in you at all? We, we all have done crazy things, stupid things, everybody, everybody. And if you get to live a long life, you have more of a chance to hit your toe. These were intended hit my toes. This isn't an accident. They explicitly said what they said. They explicitly did what they did. They explicitly didn't answer even on a time to get retribution and say, I'm really sorry or made a horrible mistake or whatever. Still not say, I just read things today on Kyrie. I've never met Kyrie and I've never met Yi. But I say to you is, and they have the right to live their life, but it would be without Sonny Vaccaro. Hmm. Everybody talks about the greatest of all time. Do you measure Michael and LeBron as greatest of all time with impact, sneaker, sales, or championships? Well, <laughs> you're so, you, you laid them all out there. It's a good question, but it's not a fair question because each of them are different, you know, way. You, I mean, when you're taking one at a time, you might put another guy in there, most competitive. You, you might put another guy in there, you know, 
or whatever. Because if you go just to most championships, well, I was talking to your friend this morning again, and you know it was Bill Russell. I mean, you know, I mean, he won more championships than anybody. So if that's the criteria you're doing, it, no one's ever done with Bill then. No one's ever individually. There have been other people who have done individual things better than you know the shoe. I mean, you go back to Converse and the Stan Smith shoe that survived the test of time. We're still selling a thousand years later. What I'm trying to say to your audience is, and I know where you're coming from, they all have a niche, but the latest guy, just like Victor, has the most advantage. What do you think, if you allow yourself and your audience to answer this question truthfully to themselves, what the hell do you think Michael could have got today? Michael Jordan is, you know, in himself you know, in playing basketball, strictly basketball, and do what you want. First of all, an athlete is a performer. You're no different than an opera singer, a pianist. You're no different than us, you know, whatever it is. We as individuals in the world have, have picked out and chosen, not picked out, but blessed with the ability to do other things. Everyone in their own realm has success and done well. But an athlete becomes closer to our heart because you don't have to be a fan of a particular team to be a fan of an individual. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's not, it's just not even close. And like I said, I've witnessed, eight, I'm around 83 years and I was 24 when I first started. At 60 years, I've been given an up close view of that scenery. I'm saying to you and your audience is, it's ambiguous, that question. And, uh, you know, I just think Michael would have, Dominate, you got to put everybody in the category. So you want to go real quick. Uh, I'll give you an answer on each of each individual you want to, or each thing again. Do you get, can you do that for a minute for me? Of course. Re repeat it, go ahead. I want to go, you would say, say one at a time. Michael. Would have been the greatest in anything he wanted to do if allowed to pursue what he did throughout, throughout another lifetime. But that's not going to happen. So in 1984, Till, until the next one came, and who would that be? I have to say there's a, a hundred great athletes and great guys who had their shoe between, but LeBron, Kobe, and then back to back with Tracy, because people keep forgetting, Tracy had T-Mac, like tomorrow morning, one year later, another 18 year old. But history was not the way it is then. Mm -hmm. the, the, the publicity wasn't the same, it was the 90s, okay? But LeBron opened the door for Zion and whoever Victor's going to be or whatever, but LeBron did. And LeBron had more time to get acclimated to the public and the public. Tracy and Kobe, like I said, Tracy never had a high school team until he came to the camp. Kobe was a, was a European until he came to the camp. Mm -hmm. So it was identification. So I, I just want, but what LeBron's done personally, Personally, he's done more for just being an athlete. I, I'm not getting into particular like people classifying the best Italian, the best this, the best the color of that or this. As a human being and being an athlete, what I witnessed in the first years of his life, because he's in, you know, he's just 36, 37, God gives him 100 more years, is stand up, make statements, screw up once in a while, take it. And, and continue on. What he done with his school to me was such an unbelievable thing. And we have others following. This generation of guys have done more for the underprivileged or for kids. Practically all the kids I know now that, that I was around when they had come to ABCD camp or going to the big time tournament, Brad, is, uh, is they're sponsoring hundreds and hundreds of kids to go to these camps for nothing to get exposure, not just the replicas of them. So the, today's athlete was stirred up benevolently by LeBron. Michael being Michael, and at the time he did it, it was interesting, but it sort of beats him up the rest of his life, which I don't think it's fair, you know, what he did. Like he wouldn't let politics interfere with selling shoes. Everyone mm -hmm. knows what I'm talking about. But this is the 1980s, 1990s, and whatever it was. And, in the world, it wasn't maybe, and who was I to say whatever, you know, because I know what 
party belongs to. That was never the question. Mm. This year here, th this generation here, we're so aware of everything you do. Don't go to the bathroom and forget to wipe your rear end because Ooh. you're in a spot. You're in trouble. Yeah, you are. Sonny, when's the last time you spoke to Michael Jordan? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> How, I find, in fact, you know, a man that was close to me as you can get at that time, also uh, Howard White worked for Nike and he's now running, you know, Jordan Brand and all that. Howard was a kid who was going to play for me in a round ball. He broke his leg and I didn't pick him. Seriously, he was a great player in high school. And uh, he ran, he was with me. When Pam and I traveled everywhere, we went to Europe with Michael and Howard came along with us. Pam and I were there Saturday Night Live. I mean, we, we did a special with Michael, but Howard was always there. So he would be, you know, the person that, the, you know, that question that I've watched just grow up and become people who are of, of, of substance. Could ABCD camp exist today and what would it look like? Well, ABC camp, it could never look like it did before because there's never going to be another ABCD camp. And uh, if you hate me, you can't go across. All you've got to go do, I'm saying, you, you just got to be honest. Go see the kids that came. Kevin Love came, come from a strictly Nike town in Portland, Oregon. I mean, I'll never forget. He wanted to play against Greg Oden. We had a matchup. Who's going to forget LeBron and you know, our guy from New York. Uh, I, I just said we had matchups every day, every game. You know, it was always newcomers. Like I said, McGrady was the greatest surprise. His high school coach didn't want us to pick him. That's, that story's been told. And my wife wouldn't let a high school coach because he, he come from a bad area. You know, he had tough times growing up. The guy grows up, he's in a hall of fame. He's married, got children. You know, he's done wonderful things. I'm saying that to you because the world has changed. I, I'm here now and God has given me a, at least a sound mind. I forget every once in a while, but yeah. I've watched the transition. Michael can't exist again mm -hmm. because everything has changed. But the new guy and, you know, LeBron and Zion, he keeps getting hurt, but Zion's a brilliant talent. He's a charismatic young man. But there are some other guys we're watching. I watch these NBA games every night. I, I you know, you know, I, 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 I follow individuals. I follow and I watch them grow up. But when I watched the Redeem team, I watched a lot of the kids that came through ABCD or played the Round Ball Classic. You know, I, I watched those kids and Pam and I sat, we cried the other night. We cried and it's nice to see success. You don't, you don't have to be constant companions and you don't have to be intimate friends. It's very hard to be an intimate friend all your life or it, circumstances change the direction you go in. Like I said, I just kept going. Then when I got out of it in 2007, I did it with every time Son of a Carrie did everything. I got out of it. I dropped the game, the camp, and most of all, the All-Star the, the, the all game, the camp, and ABCD camp. And if you take away any... Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brandon. No, gentlemen first. Well, you know, when you take it that way, I'm 24 years old and I start an all-star game. Wow. I go to the ABCD camp and never, we were, Nike wasn't involved with any camps in 1984. I see the thing they're doing, but they have financial problems there. I convinced Rob Strauss and Phil Knight to give me money to pay the bills. They didn't want the responsibility and Pam and I, we didn't underwrite it. Nike or D, all my sponsors always financially did. But we paid the insurance and we had to sign our names to the liability. So we acquired the greatest camp in the world. In the big time tournament through Gary Charles today is still going in Las Vegas. We started with, you know, 60 teams or something in 1992 or 93. There's thousands of kids going to Las Vegas that third week in July. You know, that, mm -hmm. but what's happened to answer your question? USA basketball wasn't existing. And then when it was at the end of my reign, now they have, they go all over the world with these kids. They bring them out to, and that's good. And the kids get to play and they get picked for these all, you know, these games you play USA, America. You're like nine years old now. You're going to a camp, mm -hmm. which is great. I have no problem with anything they're doing. If a kid gets a chance, I'm for it. Magic Johnson, uh, you've told me in the past, you respect his business acumen and his ability to generate more income post-career and donate to community post-career. 
when you looked at his era, he wore the Converse weapons. He wasn't making a ton of money monetarily, but you know was offered stocks and ultimately did not take that route. If Magic, John we talk about Michael, we talk about Kobe, we talk about LeBron a lot, but if Magic Johnson came into the NBA today, what would contracts look like now for him? It would be what, what we're talking about, the Victor thing. I mean, Magic was special. And not only special as a great, great talent, he was special as a communicator, a guy that could you know, involve himself with everything. Magic, maybe there's another category in there, the most charismatic of all the people, mm -hmm. Magic Johnson. There's no question about it. And to this day, Magic has a smile on his face when he gets smacked in his face. You and I both know that. And he's been smacked a few times. He goes on. He looks at that smack. He says, what can I do? How do I change it? He's adjusted to everything positive and negative in his life. And he's adjusted well. Last question. You've been involved in Michael. You've been involved in McGrady, Kobe, uh, Ed O'Bannon in the NCAA, ABCD camp, uh, a myriad of other things. You in your position, what's the next thing, sneaker-wise, talent-wise, that people should be paying attention to in the next one to five years? Well, the next thing that I would hope would be none of them. It would be the free emancipation of all kids who choose to go to college and earn a living while they're going to college by doing the dorm. What you're seeing now at the NILs was what, not what I thought it would be, but I, just for the record, I think the most exploitive, not other than political or religious, because they affect you as a human being. Other than that, I would say the NCAA, because they, with intent on always subjecting the athlete to a negative form of what they were doing, was never included in the success, financially, spiritually, academically, and what they did, a complete abolishment of the NCAA as we know it as we know it. There has to be room in there, and there is now. We're just talking about women in sports. The NIL opened that door for the girls. Mm -hmm. They had Title IX and Title VIII and Title XX and all that, but the girls going to the basketball team to the playoffs and, and finding out that they didn't get anything, everyone knew they never got with the same thing in the, the tournament. I just think the NCAA, and I'm not saying the individuals are corrupt by nature. I'm saying they're it's they're misled by occupation. The NCAA actually believes that they own them. They actually believe that they're in the 1900s like England was, and it was a segregated community. I'm not saying black and white, I'm saying in earning money and not earning money. They just said, you can't earn it, we're calling you an amateur. And worst of all to me, and I, and I get beat up more for this than the other thing, is I hate the phrase student athlete. Hmm. The only word, the only place in all college sports is they use the word student doctor, student <laughs> you know, and mathematician, student, you know, whatever. No one else is a student at that university. And that's why the university is there for all. You would think that they would say that about these, what they always say, the scientists, the journalists, the, the doctors. You would say student doctor. You don't, but you say student athlete. So you just keep pushing that button in. That's what you do. You just keep, and O'Bannon broke it. Ob Eddie was the first one. NIL started with Eddie. Alston and all the other ones before come after it. They, 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 they made, they made the, well, we never, we never got to the Supreme Court. You know, they turned us down, O'Bannon case. But we had Alston got there and Jeff did a great job, but no different than what Michael Hofstra did. No different what the lawyers before that did with all the other kids. You know, Ramogi Huma has been, you know, fighting for, for the cause for a good many years. Individuals have. But the NCAA, by the very nature of their own organization, how they give themselves their own money is beyond me that they did not do anything for. And what they just did with this, this expansion of football, first of all, college football is one of the most entertaining things, just like pro football. No matter what we say of basketball, you know, Pro football got the world by the butt and top echelon college football, especially in the South, you know, they earned their keep. And I watch kids get hurt. I was talking to this, this guy today and, and, and we talked about this also. How many years have we watched football players 
get brain damage? How many years have they been, you know, paralyzed for life? And the man I was talking to got injured. He's paralyzed for life for the last 40 years. That's who I was talking to, a young person that I've kept communication for 40 years. Hmm. That is true. So the NCAA did that. They made rules only for themselves. Every time there was a crisis until, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm a Kavanaugh fan, but I was so glad that he was, made a, a beautiful speech. And I'm so glad the nine of them got together and said, nine zero, nine zero, the athlete deserves their living. So to answer your question, I think what I'd ask for in my afterlife is freedom for the, the person who goes to college. And I'll leave you with this. It's ironic that one of the big scandals, and we know it's happened before, that happens when wealthy families pay a whole lot of money for their children to go to a great university. They didn't quite make it you know, academically, but they were able to get in by, and what the parents all did, no smart. They had to be part of some athletic group. What was the volleyball team, the swimming team? Did anybody ever notice that? They weren't because they, I guess they weren't involved in the gym. You know, I, I don't wanna, I, I, I'm not against the parents either. I, I, I'm not, because you know who, you, you know who did wrong? Oh. The parents did what every parent would do for their child, try and make their life better. The colleges took the money, mm -hmm. and the individuals took the money. Mm -hmm. They took the money. Why isn't that story about the colleges as opposed to the parents? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Mm -hmm.